Since April 23, 1962, Sterling Moss is pushing his Lotus V8 to its absolute limit at the Glover Trophy Race on the UK's Goodwood Circuit. He feathers the gas and blasts through the chicane, carving hard around Madwick's corner. His tiny eight-cylinder F1 car has the same horsepower as a Scion FRS, but weighs a mere 800 pounds. He buries the accelerator and watches the speedometer climb as he shoots down the Ford Water Bend. The only thing on Sterling's mind is catching up to Graham Hill. The cars approach 130 miles per hour, and Moss grips the wheel, ready to overtake Hill's BRM by inducing oversteer, a method of pushing the car's cornering abilities to supernatural lengths that very few drivers are able to manage. Ford Water Bend is the fastest section of Goodwood, and the move has to be perfect. Unfortunately, Sterling's driving isn't. As his car exits Ford Water, there is the slightest dip, which creates a pocket of wind that eliminates any room for errors. The wheel jerks in Sterling's hands as one of his tires clips the grass approaching St. Mary's turn. The impossibly light car tumbles off the track. The fiberglass and aluminum body collapses in on itself and skids to a stop, entombing Sterling inside. His bones are crushed, skin torn. Annie Strudwick, a nurse stationed nearby, rushes into action. As she approaches, she notices Sterling is alive, but in bad shape. He's covered in blood and his face is bright purple. This now legendary racer had somehow survived this horrific crash, but he was choking to death on bubble gum. Thinking quickly, she reaches into his mouth and grabs the gooey wad. <gasps> Sterling gasps in relief. The rescue crew then spends the next half hour sawing apart the frame to extract Moss from the wreck. How did one man break three world speed records, win almost half of his 529 races, and dominate the Nürburgring 1000 three years in a row? How did this household name in racing give away his only shot at winning an F1 championship title? Who was this British driver, the king whom racing never crowned? Today on Past Gas, they say a rolling stone gathers no moss, but what about a speeding car? It's Sterling Moss. Big thanks to our sponsor this week, Valvoline. That's right, baby. Valvoline was America's first motor oil brand, making them the original motor oil. Since their founding over 150 years ago, Valvoline and its scientists have been innovating, creating, and reinventing formulas. In 1886, Dr. John Ellis, Valvoline's founding father, developed petroleum-based lubricants for steam engines, replacing the animal-based lubricants that caused gummed-up valves, corroded cylinders, and leaky seals. Valvoline was the exclusive oil used in modern Model T's rolling off the assembly line in 1920, and Valvoline has been a part of America's automotive history from the beginning. Valvoline is the only motor oil with their own dedicated engine lab where they can run specialized engine tests and standardized engine tests right in their own facility, and this allows their scientists more freedom and flexibility to innovate as they have the results right at their fingertips. That's called being a nimble company. Valvoline's latest product is their Extended Protection Full Synthetic Oil. It's their best oil ever. Valvoline Extended Protection Full Synthetic offers ultimate protection designed to extend the life of your engine. I just did an oil change a couple weeks ago, and you know I threw some Valvoline in there. Get on the Valvoline train, put some Valvoline in your car today, be like me. Thank you very much, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode. Big thanks to every plate for sponsoring Past Gas. Dinner is unavoidable in that it's something that we plan around almost every day. When you think about the time that goes into deciding what to eat, shopping, prepping, and cooking dinner, it really adds up. And sure, alternatives like takeout and delivery are convenient, but they can quickly burn a hole in your wallet. Enter Every Plate, America's best value meal kit. Every Plate's quality ingredients come carefully packed and pre portioned, preventing you from buying things that you end up using once and inevitably shoved to the back of your fridge and happens to me all the time. As the easiest way to eat affordably, Every Plate offers delicious dinners that won't break the bank. Plus, we have a discount for you that we'll get to in a minute. A lot of the time I get home from work and I'm just like, 
exhausted. I don't want to think about what to cook for dinner. That's why I really like every plate. You just pick out meals ahead of time. They deliver it to your doorstep. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to go to the store. There's really detailed instructions. You can just cook it really easily. And that's what I really like about every plate. All right, so what about that discount I mentioned before? Well, try every plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering code GAS179. Get started with every plate for just $1.79 per meal by going to everyplate.com and entering the code GAS179. Thanks, every plate. Let's fucking get into it. <laughs> Let's LFGII. Let's get into it. Let's get, Let's into, get it. into it. What's up, fellas? What's up? How we doing? <laughs> um, prepping for this, I watched this uh, documentary about Sterling Moss hosted by Sir Patrick Stewart. Nice. Mm. You guys might know him as Jean-Luc Picard. Yeah. Yes, I'm familiar. From Star Trek. Yep. Yeah. So Sterling Moss in his office, in his house, like has the steering wheel from this crash like hanging on the wall and it's super bent up and uh Jean-Luc Picard is like don't you think this is like bad luck and like Sterling Moss is like no I just you know I basically like, put two mi- two middle fingers up to it and like Patrick Stewart like comes <laughs> like, <laughs> ah, like the whole time he's just like this is the coolest guy. I'm so <laughs> stoked to be here. I can't I believe I'm talking to this guy. I can't believe I'm in his house. Like the whole time he's just like giggling. That's, That's great. awesome. I love Patrick yeah. Stewart. Sir Patrick. Yeah. So Pat, well, hello everybody. Welcome back to Pass Gas. As you know, this week we were talking about Sterling Moss. This episode, a uh, lot of requests for this topic. This man, uh, we've mentioned Sterling Moss. I feel like he's popped up pretty much anytime we talk about vintage F1 stories uh his name pops up and it seems like an only natural that we now talk about him in his own episode so thank you to everybody who's requested him uh i'm excited to talk about him uh probably the most british name i've ever heard in my life (laughs) his name is an adjective and then a noun it is yeah that's some sterling moss on that tree over there Hmm. isn't that their money too sterling pounds sterling silver correct yeah, correct. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sure that those things have something to do with each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sterling is a sick name, dude. Dude, Sterling's a sick name. That'd be that'd be like if, like, I was rich in America and my name was Buck, but like way like way classier. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I knew a guy in high school named Sterling, and he was a fullback on our football team. Uh-huh. And he was one of the one of the most brutal, ruthless fullbacks I've ever seen. He would really? he would yeah. pick up kids and break them over his knee. I wanna While if I, I feel like football. I feel like if I had a kid and I named him Sterling, he'd be like really like skinny <laughs> and like little and pretty, like yeah. a gossip girl boy. Yeah. <laughs> a gossip boy. <laughs> like yeah, he'd be a gossip boy. <laughs> And he'd just be like a mean, mean person. Oh, like- it's always a gamble, man. Like you want to give your kid a cool name, but uh-huh. there's always a chance that he, he's just the opposite. Yeah. Cause I feel like names manifest who you become. Yeah. Like when I picture a Sterling, I think of like Ryan Philippi. Yes. Yeah. From Cruel Intentions. Now, like a Timothy Chalamet maybe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. I want my son to look like Timothy Chalamet and I'm a name <laughs> Sterling. <laughs> We all want our sons to look like Timothy Chalamet. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> my name is Nolan Sykes. Uh, joined, as always, by my co-hosts, uh, we got Joe Weber. Slime off a of slug's back. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Pretty good, you right? weren't kidding. That one's good. Yeah. <laughs> and James Humphrey. <laughs> uh, uh, if you ain't trying to win, you're losing it. And you can take that one to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> wow, That's man. about I'm... three different sayings in one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to use this opportunity to promote uh, my new podcast, The Long Way, uh, co-hosted by Jeremiah Burton from Donut Media. And that that's our official sign-off. That's cool. I like that. Cool, yeah. man. Yeah, keep an eye out for that. Without further ado, let's learn more about this Sterling Moss. Sterling Moss was born to wealth, 
Yeah, no shit. In 1929. <laughs> <laughs> and raised in a London mansion along the Thames River. The same estate where the famous English composer Edward Elgar created some of his greatest works. Ah, uh, yes, I'm familiar. Yes, mm-hmm. you know. Sterling's father, Alfred Moss, was himself a very successful man and the somewhat less glamorous career of dentistry. But throughout his life, Alfred also nurtured a sweet tooth for his side passion, racing. When Sterling's father wasn't knuckle deep in Londoners' disgusting mouths, he was competing (laughs) in the cycle car racing circuit. (laughs) Like, gross. Dude, uh, yeah, what was this like? Who wrote this? Sam Raimi? How, how gross would that guy's job be? Like they don't—they didn't have gloves back then. Oh, oh! Didn't even think of that. They probably didn't wash their hands that much either. That's <laughs> yeah. so nasty. Just like gross <laughs> mouths, like extracting teeth and putting like tusk in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they probably did. Uh, Alfred would blast up and down hills all over the English countryside in a 500-pound derby racer equipped with bicycle wheels and a 1,000cc motor. (laughs) Yeah, no thank you. (laughs) Alfred turned out to be a decent driver. Later, he graduated to racing real cars and used his mouth money to buy his way into the Indianapolis 500, where he drove to 16th place in a field of 22 cars. Not bad for a dentist from London. (laughs) After a half dozen years of competitive racing, Alfred met his wife, Eileen Crawford, who had made a name for herself racing on the rally circuit after driving ambulances around the combat zones of World War I Europe. Together, they had two children, Sterling and Pat Moss. You got a noun and a verb. Uh. (laughs) Man, it would suck to have a sibling named Sterling and your name is Pat. For sure. Pat's like, one of the worst ways to say touch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> As children, the Moss kids quickly took to competition and began dominating the local equestrian scene. They're big horse boys. <laughs> <laughs> Alfred got Sterling racing at the age of nine. Motor racing, that is. He bought him an Austin 7 and let him zip around their property. The 10-horsepower buggy was just enough of a thrill for the kid that he wanted to take it to the road. I want to take it to the road, Papa. Uh, I want to take it to the road. No, no. (laughs) Can I have an Austin 7, Daddy? You shut up, Pat. (laughs) You shut up. (laughs) Get in your cage, Pat. (laughs) After dangling racing in young Sterling's face his entire childhood, his father suddenly decided he should pursue a career in dentistry. Sterling defied his dad and instead began his racing career behind the wheel of his father's 1937 BMW 328. The tiny Beamer was powered by a 1971cc overhead valve straight six that put 80 horses to the skinny tires out back, and Sterling used every ounce of that power. That sounds fun. I want to drive one of these like really vintage roadsters with like crazy skinny tires. Sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I bet it'd be pretty slippy. Oh, yeah. Like a ginger mint or something. No, I'd like a grange. Yes. Alfred saw the joy it brought his son and let him continue racing. After World War II in 1948, Sterling had the chance to... uh, (laughs) Funny how we don't mention his military service. (laughs) A lot of rich kids. No, he was uh he was thirteen at this point. Grass on the field play ball. Oh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what a terrible no. phrase. Oh my god. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> like who said that to me? <laughs> like what? <laughs> like gross. Sorry, a correction. He was nineteen in nineteen forty eight. So I think he just yeah. missed. I'll let it slide. After World War II in 1948, Sterling had the chance to put down his dad's hard-earned money on a deposit for the first production Cooper 500 race car. These tiny Formula 3 Speedway racers were powered by 80 horsepower, 500cc motorcycle motors. Their ultralight bodies were crafted from hoops and pressed metal. Some of the earliest Coopers were cobbled together from crashed Fiats, but not Sterling's. 
His down payment ensured he secured one of the non-upcycled models. On the F3 circuit, the teenage Sterling was a force of nature. He stacked checkered flags, first locally, then international, quickly proving to team managers that it didn't matter if they ran a Nash, Porsche, Maserati, Cooper, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Jaguar, or even a Lister. What really mattered was that Sterling was driving. It still stands as one of the strongest F3 debuts in the early history of the sport. The day before his 21st birthday, Sterling scored his first milestone win. He secured a shocking victory at the 1950 RAC Taurus Trophy in the middle of a downpour in Northern Ireland behind the wheel of a borrowed Jaguar XJ120. Oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah. During this period of formula racing, a new kind of car would enter a race and win. Then companies would race to catch up to the tech in the winner's car. But Sterling's borrowed XJ was entirely stock, and he won with a two-mile lead over Peter Whitehead, who was named after a pimple. <laughs> and was also driving a stock XJ. Sterling was also a decade younger than the next youngest racer on the grid. It was a big victory for such a young racer, and he went on to become a repeat champion at the event six times in total. That's like so like uh like that just proves how different racing was back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If like the next youngest guy was 31. <laughs> <laughs> Like it was such yeah. like just sports in general were such like a hobby. Yeah, I was about to say it's very much like a not pro am kind of mindset, but it's still like a hobby that people are taking seriously. You know, like right, like pickleball is now, like pickleball, yeah, like pickleball is now, and then like fifty years, like there'll be like pickleball camps. Yeah, <laughs> like I gotta send my kid to pickleball camp this summer. <laughs> um, but can you imagine a dentist entering the Indy Five Hundred now? It was kind of an analog to the situation where the Chicago Blackhawks were in the playoffs and they had to reach down to like their third string goalie because the other two were injured. And he was like an accountant and came and helped them out in the playoffs a couple of years ago. Wow. But Sterling's 1955 Taurus Trophy outing was arguably the most notable. He'd recently joined the team of legendary racer Juan Manuel Bongio. And was replaced on Team Jaguar by recent Le Mans winner, Mike Hawthorne. Sterling took pole position and vanished down the road in the lead while the rest of the pack struggled to catch up. As the racers pushed to catch Sterling, Tim Mayers and William Smith, uh, getting jiggy with it, crashed at the difficult deer's leap straight away. The fastest stretch on the Dundrod circuit. A few laps later, a third racer, Richard Manwaring, was tragically killed in a fiery crash. But far ahead of the wreck, Sterling was battling Hawthorne, his replacement at Jaguar, for the lead when he blew a tire and needed to stop for a repair. Then over seven long laps in the pouring rain, Moss managed to battle back behind Hawthorne. The 265 horsepower straight eight Mercedes motor struggled to catch the Jag's lighter 3.4 liter straight six. But as the finish was approaching, Hawthorne's motor seized and Sterling coasted to another win. The tragic, bloody race would be the last tourist trophy ever run in Northern Ireland. That's just another example of how unique this era was. Because, yeah, it is a hobby kind of thing where these men of privilege are, are, you know, having fun behind these crazy machines. But then you could also die in a horrific wreck. Yeah. You know, so the stakes, the stakes are less monetary and more literal life and death, you know. There's a whole storyline on it about it on Downton Abbey. Oh. oh, Lady Mary falls in love with a racing car driver. And he dies. Well, I don't know. If, I Mary's don't always pulling stuff like that. Yeah, Classic Lady Mary. Past Gas is brought to you by BetterHelp. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Life can be overwhelming and many people are burned out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment, fatigue, or even more. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, burnout is a real thing. I actually just took a week off to hang out with my family because I was so burned out from work. It happens to the best of us. The good news is that BetterHelp is there to help you out. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. I think BetterHelp is a really good option if you're looking for a therapist, especially if you are nervous about seeing one in person. I think BetterHelp is a really good option because you don't have to 
go into a building. It's affordable. You can be matched with a specialized therapist really quickly. That's what I like about it. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Pass Gas by Donut Media listeners. Get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash passgas. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thank you, BetterHelp. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in just one tap. And your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. I really hate finding out that I've been paying for something that I don't use. Honestly, I forget that I have subscriptions and Truebill makes it so easy to get rid of them or at least control them. Truebill has over 2 million users and helped them save over $100 million. That's like the GDP of a small country. Like Matthew B who says, in a matter of seconds, I saved $660 for the year on my direct TV bill. Saved $120 for the year on my Sirius XM bill. Saved $840 a year on my car insurance. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash gas. Go right now, truebill.com slash gas. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash gas. This episode is brought to you by Credit Karma. Have you ever been rejected for a credit card? It happens way too often. That's why Credit Karma created Karma Confidence Technology, helping their members apply with more confidence. Credit Karma uses your credit profile to show you offers that are tailored to your financial situation. Credit Karma partners with a wide range of card issuers, so you can be sure that you are exploring all sorts of options. And best of all, Credit Karma uses your credit data to show your chances of approval before you even apply, helping you apply with more confidence. Comparing cards on Credit Karma is 100% free and won't affect your credit scores. That's very, very good. Credit Karma. Create your own karma. I think if you're looking for a credit card, Credit Karma is your best option for finding the one that suits you. Ready to find the card for you? Head to Credit Karma and check out your personalized mix of offers today. Go to creditkarma.com or the Credit Karma app to find the card for you. That's creditkarma with a K.com. Thank you, Credit Karma. Fast forward to 1955, and Moss is now 26 years old. It was obvious at this point that he was different from the other racers, a renaissance man behind the wheel. Sterling would float between teams and dominate different types of races. While modern legendary racers would find one discipline and stick to it, Sterling would race multiple types of cars, sometimes in a single day. Instead of taking the winter off, as other racers would do, Sterling headed to Africa and Asia to race those circuits. Today's F1 drivers average 20 races a year, widely considered to be a grueling schedule. Sterling was averaging closer to 50. Dang. And while modern drivers fly to each race and hop in a car at practice, Sterling would pack the car up and hop behind the wheel of the truck and drive the team through the night to the next track. Yeah, it doesn't stop. Yeah, it's like, take a night off, man. It's like, (laughs) chill out for a second, man. Get some McDonald's, okay? Yeah. Let Pat drive. (laughs) (laughs) In 1955, yeah, wait, yeah, let Pat drive. (laughs) I bet Pat was driving. I bet Pat doesn't get a lot of the credit that he deserves. (laughs) We'd like to dedicate this episode to Pat. Yeah, this episode is dedicated to Pat Moss. Which is one of the best activities you can do when you're in the forest. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's not just the worst way to be touched. (laughs) Jesus. In 1955, (laughs) Moss won the Royal Auto Club's British Grand Prix at Aintree, a racetrack that had never been won by a British driver before. Mercedes cars placed in the top four places with Moss in first. That year, he also won the RAC Tourist Trophy again in a Mercedes 300 SLR, the Circuito de Monsanto in a Porsche 500 Spider, and the Targa Floria in the SLR, as well as the International Gold Cup in a Maserati 250F. This guy does not have brand loyalty, which I like. It's cool, but also Monsanto? Follow the money, dude. Follow the money. The Millimiglia is typically referred to as the most dangerous and most iconic single day's drive in all of racing history. If you're an OG past gas fan, you know a lot about this already because we covered it 
in the first two episodes of this show when we talked about Enzo Ferrari. Mercedes had a bone to pick with the Milo Miglia. They hadn't won the race since 1931, and Italians dominated the podium. 1955 would be different. The Italians had an advantage in the 1,000-mile race because it cut through long swaths of Italian countryside, home turf, for the local entrance. But Sterling had a plan. He brought along Dennis Jenkinson, a motorsports journalist, and they took some test runs of the track. Jenkinson made notes on an 18-foot-long scroll of paper so he could warn Sterling of upcoming turns, much like modern rally drivers. After 10 hours, 7 minutes, and 48 seconds, Moss and Jenkinson finally stopped the famous number 722 Mercedes 300 SLR in Brescia, Italy. They averaged 97.96 miles per hour over the entire 992 miles, which was the fastest ever set and would stand as a record until the race ended two years later. The second place driver, Sterling's longtime rival, teammate, and mentor, Juan Manuel Fangio, arrived a full 30 minutes later. The success of a British driver in a German car rocked the Millimiglia and made headlines around the world. That's pretty crazy to average 97 miles per hour on just like country roads. Yeah, like for country a thousand roads miles. in the 50s in Italy in an old ass car. Yeah, bicycle tires and and to brake, you put your feet on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the Flintstones. Yeah, that'd be wild. Can you imagine how sore his forearms were? Oh, God. No power steering. Rocking. Just rocking. Sterling won 212 out of 529 races in his career. More so than his wins, however, he was a driver who was consistently helping to push forward motorsport. In every category, from strategy to technology to business, he was the first driver to run disc brakes. He drove the first rear-engined F1 car, and he opened up the world of non-racing sponsors to all drivers when he slapped the colors of El Dorado Ice Cream Company on his race car. <laughs> But for all his skill, ingenuity, and checkered flag, Sterling had yet to win a Formula One world championship. He'd come close over and over again, but no cigar. In 1958, those close calls bubbled to a climactic season in the Brit's career. Uh, he had an automatic bedroom. What does that mean? His bedroom had buttons, like Austin Powers' what? bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> and he would press a button and it would like open his blinds and like start his shower and he had he had Austin Powers bedroom. It was like the rotating bed. I I assume so. That's pretty sick. Mhm. Mm On the extremely difficult cobble-filled street track of Oporto in Portugal, Sterling and his old rival Mike Hawthorne were neck and neck battling over the crown of the first Brit to win the overall F1 title. Sterling was out front but Hawthorne was literally feet behind him. Sterling lapped Hawthorne and was ready to take the prize when he noticed his competitor had spun out and stalled. Officials rushed Hawthorne's car, but Sterling rushed over and shooed them all away so Hawthorne would not be disqualified for receiving outside assistance. Sterling yelled for him to push the car down the hill and bump start the motor, which he did, and the race continued. What? That's awesome. No. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> you don't think that's awesome? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I mean, come on. <laughs> he wants to keep racing. Uh, yeah, that's pretty fun. Uh, back at the official's tent, they argued if Hawthorne had technically traveled in reverse on the track, which would have disqualified him. Sterling rushed to his defense and explained that Hawthorne was technically on the sidewalk, not the circuit, so he couldn't have been driving in the wrong direction. The officials <laughs> shrugged and uh, awarded Hawthorne full point. Checkmate. Uh, Toto Sterling. wouldn't let this slide. No. Michael, this is an abomination. <laughs> At the end of the season, as the points were tallied, Hawthorne won the championship title by a single point, oh. which could not have happened without Sterling's help. While Sterling lost his only shot at the crown, he later told journalists he'd do it again in a second. It was simply the right thing to do. I don't know if that, yeah, would not fly today with uh, all the sponsors on the car, man. I don't yeah, think. Man, um, no, no way. I don't think. El Dorado Gelati. <laughs> yeah. uh, El Dorado <laughs> Gelati would. They might have let that slide, but. Uh, Dude, El Dorado Gelati sounds like a uh, action Bronson. Uh, <laughs> like you put your alias. name into that. I'm John Gotti, sipping El Dorado Gelati. 
<laughs> Action Bronson, Bam Bam Baklava, El Dorati Gelati. Action, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> He's yoked now. Really? Yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. By 1962, Sterling had won pretty much every type of race in every type of car there was. He was just 33 and at the top of his game, dominating the sport, beloved by racing fans all over the globe. On April 23rd at Goodwood, Sterling wrecked, chasing Graham Hill. He had fractured his leg, was covered in lacerations, and had a serious head wound. He was comatose for almost a month and partially paralyzed for more than six months. It was a long road to recovery that was met by setback after setback. A year after the accident, Sterling slid behind the wheel of a familiar Lotus 19 and returned to Goodwood. He pushed the car as hard as he could, sailing along straights and throwing it hard into corners, relying on the same oversteer that almost cost him his life. But when he stopped his car and saw his time, he was a few tenths of a second slower than before. Sterling dropped his helmet into the Lotus and walked away from racing entirely. Later, he would say that his instinctual control over the vehicle was gone. What was once an extension of his body now took conscious effort, and even though he was less than a second slower, he knew his mojo was gone. It made for an anticlimactic end to a storied racing career, but Sterling did what so many other drivers couldn't, know when it was time to quit. That's pretty like honorable, but also kind of an overreaction, I feel like. It's only a couple of Also, tenths. if it's his first time back in the car, like... Yeah, dude, give it a month. <laughs> yeah, Sterling Moss. Yes, yeah. Sterling Moss. And also his mojo. Yeah, I know. Honestly, <laughs> is Austin Powers. This guy is Austin yeah. Powers. <laughs> yeah. After his body healed, Sterling found himself bored, as many race car drivers do in retirement. He needed a way to pass the time, so Moss found his way over to ABC's Wide World of Sports to be their color commentary for NASCAR. Whoa. Weird. While his thick British accent was certainly appreciated during 1980s NASCAR races, he eventually moved on and spent more of his time narrating Formula One season. But talking about racing wasn't enough. While he had unofficially retired in 1962, Sterling popped up here and there at a few one-off races. Most notable was the grueling 18,000-mile 1974 oh London Sahara Munich World Cup rally where Sterling <laughs> showed up in a Mercedes 280E. Who thought of that race where it's like <laughs> yeah. London to Sahara to Munich? Someone from Munich needed someone in London to pick up something in the Sahara yeah. and bring it to Some, them. like, Moroccan food. Mm-hmm. Uh, This ridiculous rally began in London and wound its way to Munich via Nigeria. (laughs) In total, 70 cars entered the race and only 19 managed to complete it. Notable among the ones who were left stranded was Sterling Moss. I would love to do a rally like this. Mm -hmm. Some ridiculously long drive. Yeah. Yeah. Be cool. Uh, While racing near Bakar, Algeria, Sterling and his team found that there were a few errors in the map due to a few roads being demolished and rebuilt between map making and racing. Most of the competitors were lost in the Sahara with little hope. Experienced drivers referred to it as the most grueling terrain of any rally ever. Race officials hired helicopters and small airplanes to locate all the racers once they realized they had been spread out all over the African oh, desert. God. Many were lost for days, <laughs> driving circles around the sandy roads while bartering with locals for food oh and water. God. A handful of racers abandoned the route and set out for civilization where they traded their cars for airfare back to Europe. <laughs> do you still want to do this, Nolan? I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Sounds like the last season of High Low. <laughs> hey. You just got to trade your, <laughs> your low car for like a Spirit Air ticket. Dude, that thing's it, it worth at least United Business Class. <laughs> I mean, low car's now like 50 grand. Yeah, it's an expensive car now. Uh, high car is $100,000. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> In part. <laughs> it's so wild. 
This episode is brought to you by Stitch Fix. Shopping for new clothes can be time consuming and stressful. So why not let Stitch Fix do all the work so that you can spend more time doing the things you love? I've used Stitch Fix and I actually really love this service. I'm not really a huge shopping guy, but Stitch Fix's online quiz and delivery made things super simple and all the clothes that they sent me were awesome. Stitch Fix is easy and fun to get started. First, you take a few minutes to set up your Stitch Fix style profile. You answer a few questions about what you like to wear, what you don't like to wear, and how open you are to trying new styles. It's pretty cool. After you're done doing the quiz, that's when Stitch Fix's expert stylists will go to work finding items exclusively for you. Every piece is handpicked for you and is unique to your style, size, and your budget, making it the best way to discover clothes that make you look and feel your best. Stitch Fix will send you five pieces to try on at home. You keep what you love and send back what you don't. Shipping, returns, and exchanges are free and easy. Plus, there's no subscription required. Try one or set up automatic deliveries, there are no hidden fees ever. Sign up for Stitch Fix and get the season's latest pieces for women, men, and kids. Sign up today at stitchfix.com slash gas to get 20 bucks off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash gas to get $20 off your first purchase. It's a limited time offer. Purchase within two days of sign up. Thank you, Stitch Fix, for sponsoring this episode. The formula racing season is going strong. And next up is Monaco. Get in on all the action with DraftKings Sportsbook. Right now, new customers can place their first bet of $5 or more. And if your bet loses, you'll get a risk-free bet up to $1,000. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state, you can experience the thrills of racing on the DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports app. Go full throttle till the checkered flag drops and compete for your share of over $100,000 in prizes. Draft your lineup of five drivers and one constructor to rack up points for top finishes, laps, sled and more. DraftKings is safe, secure and reliable. Best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. I got DraftKings on my phone and I love it. It makes the racing more engaging and you know, winning money isn't bad either. <laughs> Don't miss out on all the action this week at DraftKings. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app today. Use code GAS at sign up. New customers can place their first bet of $5 or more on the race and if your bet loses, you'll get a risk-free bet of up to $1,000. That's code GAS at DraftKings Sportsbook. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. Hey, another thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline. You already know what it is. They're America's first motor oil brand, but I want to talk to you about their gear oil. That's right, their new Flex Fill gear oil. Valvoline is already the number one gear oil brand, but their new flexible pouch makes it super easy to get into tight spaces and also produces less waste. Think of this big old Flex Fill pouch like a big old juice pouch that you'd have in your lunchbox in third grade except it's full of gear oil for your car. It comes in two full synthetic grades, 75 weight 90 and 75 weight 140, available for exceptional high and low temperature protection. It's also got an extreme pressure additive for better load carry capacity and wear protection, and the anti-foam agent quickly breaks down foam for better lubrication. We used it in low car when we were building that, and you should too. This stuff will not let you down. So get on that Valvoline train, put some Valvoline motor oil in your car, put some Valvoline gear oil in your car, it's not going to let you down. Thank you very much, Valvoline, for sponsoring this episode. Sterling and his team stayed true to course, but they continued to overheat in the 280E and eventually found their way to an abandoned Algerian military fort. With an empty radiator and less than a gallon of water between them, they were forced to sit and wait for several days for officials to deliver water to them so they could continue the race. But by the time they were rehydrated, the race had continued without them. In 1980, again, Sterling returned to competition. He showed up at the British Saloon Car Championship with the GTI Engineering Audi team, but he didn't do too well. He continued to race historic cars and would show up to any special races he was invited to participate in, as long as it didn't interfere with his Playboy retiree lifestyle. Ooh, got the automatic shower button. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> In 2004, <laughs> Sterling arrived at a promotion for the new Mercedes-Benz SLR to find his old friend, the exact number 722-300-SLR he won the Millimegli in. With zero hesitation, Sterling jumped behind the wheel and took to the track. A reporter who had joined him said that the 75-year-old was better than everyone else there. I doubt it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
That is a very reporter thing to say about a famous old man. They're like waiting for a statement from the reporter and Sterling Moss is like waiting behind him to see what he says. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's better than everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did so good. He did so good. He's better than everyone here. I'm so proud of him. And on June 9th, 2011, while attempting to qualify for the Le Mans Legends race at the age of 81, Sterling handed off his helmet and gloves and told Radio Le Mans that he was actually done racing. Done, done. done. For real this time. He explained that the Porsche RS 61 was just too fast for him and it deserved a better driver. He told the press that he was a racer, not a driver, meaning that even as an octogenarian, yeah, in his 80s. Great. He, he, he also told the press that he was a racer, not a driver, meaning that even as an octogenarian, he wanted to win, not just keep pace. That's pretty dignified. And then when he was 99, he returned to racing. <laughs> <laughs> At the peak of his career, Sterling would reach 180 mile per hour top speeds, just 15 shy of top racers today, with nothing more than determination and a helmet. Eh, more like 40 miles. They hit 220 yeah. at Baku. Compared to modern F1 cars and other race cars, the machines Sterling piloted were primitive and unreliable, but he was able to get the most out of every car he drove. Car's brakes were also awful. He was the first driver to run disc brakes at the Millimiglia, and they'd run so hot they'd boil over the brake fluid. Tires in the 1950s were atrocious as well. Sterling would constantly fight both over and understeer to keep the car on track, while today's tires are grippy and hold the line. He managed to survive the most dangerous era of racing, but just barely. At 80, Sterling fell three stories down an elevator shaft, what? Shattering oh his God. legs and chipping his spine, but he survived. What was he doing in there? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, man. He was being years- sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> Serves him right. <laughs> Six years later, he suffered a near fatal chest infection, keyword being near. The guy was almost indestructible. But on April 12th, 2020, Moss finally passed away at his long-time home in Mayfair, London, after a long illness. I didn't realize it was that recent. I know. Crazy, right? Yeah. In his 90 years of life, he had lived several lifetimes across just as many racing disciplines. Widely described as one of the greatest drivers to never win an F1 championship, we'd rather simplify things. Sterling was one of the greatest drivers, full stop. Full stop, but he never did. Full stop. Full stop. But he never did. I wonder if Pat's still alive. Uh, Probably. That's his younger brother, so maybe. Uh, well, that's our story this week. We have some listener email to get through. We have a listener email to read. Dan writes, hi, Nolan, James, and Joe. I'm a longtime listener, first-time emailer. I'm from the land of England and just wanted to say I love your show's perfect balance of humor and history. Humor well, with you, an O-U. Dan. Very OU. British. Dan, are you British? Whoa. That's how That's Sterling how Moss would have written it. Yeah. That's how we know. That's how we know. Just one fun fact for you guys. Okay. Adrian Newey and Jeremy Clarkson were both at the same school, Repton School, at the same time, both kicked out and are now members of its notable alumni list. Uh, that is a fun fact. Just like Cameron Diaz and Snoop Dogg both went to Long Beach Polytechnic. Wait, but if they got kicked time. out, they didn't graduate. How are they alumni? Because they're rich. If you get successful enough, they're going to claim you, you know? Yeah, that's lame. Dan also writes, I have an episode idea, the crazy story of the 1958 Cuban Grand Prix in which five-time world champion Juan Manuel Fangio was kidnapped before the race oh, by yeah. Fidel Castro and his rebels to boycott that the race. That would be a fun episode. That would be fun. That would be fun. That would be fun. Remember to keep it juiced. Yeah, yo. We should write that movie starring Danny McBride. <laughs> as as, <laughs> as uh, Castro. As Juan Manuel. No, as Castro. Castro. Yeah. As Castro. And, and the guy who plays Stevie in Eastbound and Down can play Raul, his brother. Yeah, yeah. And then Fangio's like Timothy Chamolet. <laughs> Chamolet. <laughs> <laughs> 
if you'd like to get in contact with us, hit us up at passgas at donutmedia.com. Oh, wait, guys, before we get the correction next week, Patricia Ann Moss was his sister. Oh, no. What? Oh, no. And she was one of the most successful female auto rally driv- drivers of all time, achieving three outright that? wins and seven podium finishes in international rallies. She's crowned okay, well, European Ladies Rally Champion five times. That's awesome. Well, That's we were cool. talking about her like she was a, sl- a <laughs> yeah. slow boy, but apparently she was a very fast girl. <laughs> Let us know if you want us to do How an episode on Pat Moss because she seems awesome. Like in my in my head, I thought he was just like this dumpy yeah. guy covered in hay. I thought that we said Pat was a. Uh, Boy, yeah, wait a point. minute. I thought so too. <laughs> well, we apologize to Pat. Yeah, well, Mark. thank you for correcting us, Tommy, our producer. Uh, that's pretty embarrassing. Oh, that is weird. Okay, so Eileen Crawford, who we talked about, she was also a rally racer. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, we mentioned that. Who drove the ambulances? Okay, well, that's on us. Sorry about that. Hit up the boys at James Pumphrey, at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Uh, follow Donut on all social media if you'd like. Two big thank you to our producers, uh, Thomas Willett and Gavin Kinzel. And our writer, Jacob Desjardins. Yes. So thank you very much, boys. You know what? We make, we make mistakes, but at the end of the day, slime off a slug's back. That's right. All right. See you later. <laughs>